And hello, everyone. Welcome to The Real Estate Show on KCMX News Media 880 and on YouTube at realestateshoworegon.com. Thanks for joining us. I'm Pete Belcastro. At the far end down there is Joe Brett. This is Alice Lima. We're all brokers with John L. Scott in Southern Oregon. We get together with you once a week to talk about real estate issues around our region. And boy, do we have lots to talk about today with the fella in the center here in the white shirt, because that is Glenn Cunningham. Glenn's the owner, uh, co-owner of, uh, well, I guess the owner of uh, Naglin Padilla, who's the uh, CPA in Ashland and has been on our show, I'm guessing, I don't know, five or six years, haven't you? Six Once years. a year we get you to come, right? It's been six years. You got to talk really closer to that to microphone. Here. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So it's great to have you here also. And, and, and uh, Glenn would have the numbers right. There's a good guy to ask. Six yeah. years. Yeah. Actually, yeah. Well, before we start, we just want to say this is the kind of the end of 10 years of this show that uh, Joe and I have been with you for so long. Of course, Joe's going to be leaving us and Alice taking Joe's place or talking around here everywhere. But I went back to- It's an upgrade. <laughs> I thought you might find it interesting because we talk about how good the market is, right? There's a $345,000 median price, et cetera. In 2012, when I went back and looked this up, at this time then, the median price of a home in Jackson County was $145,000, Alice. Wow, what a difference. That wasn't that long ago either. No, $145,000. There were 1,500 listings then. Yeah. Uh, we wouldn't have that many today. I mean, there was 1,500 listings. Lots of inventory. A lot, lot of inventory. And what's so interesting, there were 37% of the sales in that three-month period were regular sales. 37%. That meant that, how I many was that? 67%. 63. Were short sales. foreclosures and short sales. So, yeah, more than half were distressed. They call it the distressed category yeah. were short sales and <coughs> foreclosures. Yeah. Amazing how far this market has really come. Glenn Cunningham, you've seen all this as well. I mean, you were you were there working when this, the crash came and the, the rebound. And it's amazing how far it's come, hasn't it? It is amazing how far it's come, but it's taken a really long time for us to get here, Pete. Yeah. Uh, I'm uh, surprised that in a lot of ways, prices are only now approaching where they were back in 2006, 2007, yeah, yeah, and yeah. 2008. So yeah, there was a big crash. And yeah, what happened in 2012 was pretty, uh, in, in 2012 and how the recovery was so slow uh, in 2012 was amazing and really sad, but it's still taken a really long time for us to get back to where we were uh, before the crash happened in 2007. But this, th doesn't this feel a little bit better though than in 2007? I mean, the lending is different. Uh, uh, all, all the things that brought us over the cliff don't seem to be there today. Is that yeah, the, the, the is lending that has really loosened up a lot for better or for worse. They're starting to come back with some of those programs that they had before. They are? That's yeah. not good. Yeah, we and F <laughs> FHA has reduced some of their um, qualifying credit scores down below 600. What okay. that means in English is that if you think you have a bad credit score and cannot buy a house, you should really go check with somebody because mm -hmm. sometimes we have buyers uh, with credit scores at 580 and 588 that are still able to swing a house. Mm -hmm. So yep. go I, I, check. Yeah, well, I hope that doesn't happen. We, we, lenders need to be aware. We always talk about that, don't we? I'm curious, Glenn, uh, as, as we went, last year when you were here, that the, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act had just passed and everybody was in a tither over what was going to happen, how it was going to affect real estate, landlords, investors, everything about that. How did it affect, uh, as you did taxes this year? Could you tell us just a little bit about your experience with kind of clients, uh, it's real estate, whatever, about what happened with the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act? That's a great question, and we're still in the midst of it. Really? Uh, and it's taking a really long time. The re legislation passed in December of 2017. The IRS didn't get around to giving us preliminary regulations on how they were going to uh, enforce the law until the summer of 2018. Yeah. And the last final, summer. The, last summer. Right. Yeah. The That's fin a long time. The final <laughs> regulations were finally released in uh, January of 2019. About a week after the tax filing season started, <laughs> we got the final regulations. And the, wow. the final regulations were significantly different from what the IRS told us they were going oh, really? to okay. do in June of 2018. All right. 
it's surprising that they got as much done as they did in mm. that period sure, of time. Sure. Because remember, in December and January of 2018, 2019, the government was shut down. There was oh, a right. furlough. That's right. Yeah. So the IRS issued thousands of pages of regulations that were written while the government was shut down. Yeah. And they really do deserve a lot of credit for getting their sure. act together and getting it delivered. Yeah. It is the most significant change to the tax code since Long 1986. Time. And I remember that. Wow. Bob Packwood, Senator Packwood, was the, we were in the news <laughs> business then. We yep. remember that. What were the biggest things that the tax, that the thing brought up to you? What were the biggest things, well, challenges? One whatever? of the key things for people who own real property as an investment and as a rental is the qualified business income deduction. Okay. You'll hear it called uh, qualified business income, QBI, section right. 199A. And it is a very powerful way for people who own real property with a profit motive to reduce their taxes. With a profit motive. What, so what investors. Okay. Investors. Investors. People who uh, own real estate and rent them out. Landlords, right? Ra yeah. Landlords. Are you talking about commercial real estate as well? Commercial, that kind of and, thing? commercial and residential. Commercial. Okay. So if you own a multi-unit apartment building okay. and you spend 10 hours, 15 hours a week negotiating leases with tenants, collecting rents, doing repairs, uh -huh. you are actively involved in a trade or business okay. and you would probably be eligible for this qualified business income deduction, okay. which is a 20% reduction in taxable income. Uh, that was the that's big thing. Huge. Wasn't that a big thing yeah. last yeah. year? Remember that? Yeah, okay, that's, that, awesome. that's what we're talking it's about. It's absolutely that's huge. So multi-unit residential, uh, multi-unit commercial, it's probably very likely that you qualify for this deduction. However, the IRS saw lots of opportunities for people to cook the books. Oh. Um, and <laughs> yeah. there are people who may not be eligible for this deduction. Okay. The IRS has put a red line, and that red line is that you have to have a profit motive and you have to regularly and continuously perform, perform work, services. Work. Right. 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 So when do yeah. you not qualify for sure? If you have a triple net lease, and for your listeners who may not know, a triple net uh. lease is where the tenant pays the property taxes, the insurance, and is responsible for all of the maintenance on the property. Mm. Aren't most aren't most triple net uh, a lot of triple net leases out there, Alice? Right? Uh, there are with the commercial. So um, having those may not be an advantage as, the, as such an advantage as it was, right? Maybe that is absolutely correct. Really? Wow! Yeah. So so that, that, I can just I can <laughs> I can just hear. Bunch of people who own commercial properties just blowing, yeah, blowing up right ears now. Just yeah, they just spit their coffee right out. Now. Exactly. <laughs> so in the okay. regulations, it specifically says that if you have a triple net lease, and they define what a triple net okay. lease is in the IRS's eyes, you do not qualify for this deduction. Okay. And that was one of the big things that you saw this last, this first year with that. This happened okay. th th when the final regulations were issued in January. That's when we had a very clear picture okay. of what that meant. Now, there's still a lot of dispute about the individual components of what constitutes a triple net lease. Okay, mm. uh, yeah, of course. Yeah. So, so <laughs> and, 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 and you, you, you just can't say you got to pay this, this, and this. We're going to have a sub subject in chapter seven. Okay, and, and those things won't be settled until they're no. a and it's going to change okay. next year. Right, by right, the way, right. potentially. Okay, see, we can talk to you for hours. You know that, and I. I, I, I what else is this? I got to go. I got so many things to ask. We got so many things to ask you. Okay, so, go ahead. so um, I want to define you know, the, a situation that may be gray for certain people. Okay. Let's say that you um, you rent out your basement, okay? Okay, you a, or you're a vacation rental, or, a short-term vacation rental, it, right? Things it, like that, okay. It, it, well, uh, short-term vacation rentals are a little, a little, bit, okay. a little right. bit different because it constitutes a different kind of activity. Okay. But you rent out a part of your house. Okay. Um, you rent an additional dwelling unit okay. out. How do you determine that you would potentially qualify for this QBI deduction, for the Qualified Business okay. Income Deduction? Well, you have to um, keep separate books and records. Separate, mm, yes, right. separate, okay. separate okay. books. You got to have separate checking accounts. You got to act like a business to, in order to get the deduction, right? Exactly. If That's it simple. walks like a duck and yeah. talks <laughs> like That's a duck, simple. it's more likely that it will be a duck. Yeah. So if yeah. you're if you're um, renting out one of your bedrooms or two of your bedrooms, like people like roommates, you have roommates, and you and you can 
um, have a separate um, set of books and a bank account that you can possibly qualify for this? You absolutely can. So yeah. our millennials that are doing these uh, kind of group purchase things yeah. with houses and, and uh, multifamily units, they need to know this. That's, one that's of the true, yeah. But, yeah. The, but um, one of the key things, Alice, and we're going to talk about this a little bit later on, is the profit motive. Because often a group of friends will get together with one in the lead who brought the biggest pile of money to the table. And oh, okay. he, he or she may not charge their roommates fair market, fair market value. Oh. You, you got to be making the profit, right? Fair you market show you're value. Making well, you don't have to make, no, a, make profit. a profit. They can't legislate right. making a profit, but they can legislate intent. Ah, and okay. intent is really hard to prove under audit without substantiation. Okay, mm. sure, yeah. So <laughs> ha if you do enter into one of these situations, I suggest that the, the landlord substantiate. What is fair market value rent in the community? What are similar properties okay, rent sure. for? And document that what you're charging is close to or above what the fair market value okay, rent is. Yeah. I can give you an example, and we talked about this a little bit before we went on the air. And that is mom and dad buy a house so junior uh, can go to Corvallis and a attend Oregon State. Sure. And mom and dad want uh, junior to have some of his friends live in that house. Uh -huh. And all and they're really, it, and all they're yeah, really yeah, interested yeah. in is having the friends pay the mortgage and right. the property taxes and the utilities. Makes sense. Yeah, yeah but it does make sense. But that's not fair market value rent. Uh, right. Because that's not for you, you, you're, um, you haven't looked at what the similar properties would rent for. Sure. You don't have a profit motive. You're basically doing no, it no so Junior has a nice right. place Break to even. live. I've, I've yeah. seen people do that in Ashland, buy pro mm -hmm. sold actually it, people properties who bought them for their children mm -hmm. to, to attend SOU. Right. But they, right, they weren't in the profit business. It wasn't like you have, in, Alice, your investors who are making money and wanting to make, you know, do this. And one of the significant challenges of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act is not only if it doesn't rise to the level of a profit motive, a trade or business, you don't qualify for the qualified business income deduction. Right. But another piece for what I call these not-for-profit rentals is that if you don't have a profit motive, you can't deduct any of the expenses except the property taxes, ah, which are okay. limited, yep. and the mortgage interest if there is one. So if you pay utilities, you pay insurance, you can't deduct that well, stuff. What if you have to put on a new roof? You can't deduct wow. it. Wow. can't deduct okay. it. Okay. Oh. So here's a good reason to not pocket the cash, right? Keep a separate set of books. Make yes. it a real business. Make I mean, go to, business. go to that extra yeah. trouble. Yeah. And I document that it's a real business. We've talked about that for yeah. years, yeah. haven't we? You yeah. create the business, do it the right yeah. way, do your due diligence, mm -hmm. and you get advantages. At that. That's we, 20, that's we've 20%. had good guidance with yeah. that. And that 20% <laughs> makes a big difference, doesn't it, yeah. too, at the bottom line in taxes, Huge. doesn't it? It can be a significant, significant amount. amount of money. All right. And uh, the more, the larger, the larger the business activity is, the more substantial this deduction yeah. can be. All right. Well, look, we have eight pages of stuff with Glenn. We've gone through <laughs> a half a page here in the first segment. We're done. <laughs> wait, wait, I don't know what we're going to do. we got a break coming up here. We're with Glenn Cunningham from CPA and talking about taxes, real estate, all that kind of thing. Pete and Joe and Alice, we're coming right back. The Real Estate Show continues after this. Welcome back to The Real Estate Show on KCMX News Media 880 and on YouTube at realestateshoworegon.com. We're having a terrific time today. Thank you for joining us. The end of June, the end of a 10-year run with Joe and I here, almost 500 shows. Pete and Joe and Alice Lima here as well, and Glenn Cunningham, the CPA from Nagel and Padilla, is with us in and, the house today. And I'm hoping I get to come back as a guest. Look, oh, absolutely. You can come back Every time. week. Yeah, yeah. Every week. Yeah. And you're keeping your license. I think that's yeah. what I'm yeah, saying. Yeah, that is. You're just yeah. Kind of stepping that's important. back from everyday kind of stuff at it. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we've had a lot of fun. My God, 10 years, and all the people that we've met uh, who've, who've sat here like Glenn, and, and, it and it listened to us. And, and the one thing <laughs> is, I swear we should have got one hour of credit. Yeah, I know. For continuing education on a number of the shows that we've done, yeah. and the R of R shows, and, so and and here we have an expert yeah. like uh, yeah. you, you could just not get yeah. a better source of information. It's great, it, great stuff. It's amazing when it's we're great out, to work on. Yeah, it's amazing when we're out and talking to people how much this information that we learned comes back to. Well, us, and, and also people it? ask every day, yeah. you know, whether they're buying or selling or yeah. investing, they want to know. Yeah. 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 Anyway, so thanks for being here today, Glenn, and all that kind of stuff, yeah. continuing yeah. that uh, that that tradition for yeah. us. Okay. Taxes. I got one question that I'm going to stop because I know you, this could go on for an hour, hours with this. 
The ten thousand dollars that a person could deduct from their what their property taxes, income taxes, that was a limit that that put on there. I don't know about you thought, Alice, but I thought that that really had an effect on the on the real estate market here in the county, especially especially in second home or luxury markets. That people trying to sell them all. I mean, they just anyway. What do you think? Yeah, because it was a it was a motivating factor, not a main motivating factor, but it was definitely in the mix and carried some weight with people. So so how did that how did that go? It has had a significant impact on people's ability to deduct expenses that they were used to deducting. Yeah. And I thought before it w- implemented that it would potentially affect the second home market. Be- I thought, yes, I, was, I would have Because said that, yes. in the past, if you bought a second home, you layered on the property taxes mm-hmm. and the mortgage interest right. on that second yeah. home. And now state and local property and income taxes are limited to $10,000. So as an example, for an Oregonian, the Av- you know the average property tax in or the average income tax in Oregon is around uh, nine to ten percent. So we'll nine to ten percent, one yeah. of the highest, by the highest. way, in the country. It is. Yeah, it, it absolutely FYI. is. Yeah. So for <laughs> for easy math purposes, I'm going to put okay. it at ten. Okay. And say so you have a hundred thousand dollar taxable income. That's ten thousand dollars in income tax. Right you there. Can, you right. can't deduct any of your property taxes. Wow. And if the average yeah. home in Jackson County is selling for three hundred and forty five thousand dollars and the property tax rate is a little bit less than one percent. We're talking about thirty four hundred, thirty five hundred dollars in property taxes that would not be deductible. You're already over the limit. You're already over the limit. You can't if if I've been deducting right, if I had a luxury home and my tax I've seen I've seen tax bills twenty four thousand dollars in this county. Yeah, some of the um, biggest states have huge 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 tax huge tax bills. But that's only one piece of it, the state and local tax limit. The other piece of it is there were severe limits put on mortgage interest. In the past, uh, prior to the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, you could have up to a million dollars in mortgage interest, I'm sorry, mortgage debt before the interest was limited. Right, okay, yes. The Tax Cuts and Jobs Act reduced that to 750,000. So that's only if I have a, what, a home that is, my loan is that much or the, the, okay. okay. Your loan is that much, but, if you own a home in the Bay Area mm-hmm. and you own a home in Jackson County, uh-huh. it's highly likely that you have <laughs> more than three quarters of a million yeah, dollars easy. in mortgage debt. Yeah. So those yeah. two factors together, in my opinion, were going to have a significant impact on yeah. the ability to sell higher priced second homes. Well, re- and remember that this whole market change started in the in the it, luxury market it and it trickles down over time. But that's what started was in the luxury market. That's what market. we noticed we, first. We saw yep. at one time there was a 24 month supply. That remember wasn't that? that long ago no, either. A few months ago. Yeah. So, you're right. It started there and I think that did have an effect on on the luxury market here because there was just a ton of inventory and there's still a lot of it out there. Well, and we are a location where we have a lot of second home people. Yes. Um, people come here to vacation. Uh, mm-hmm. Some of them use it as uh, periodic vacation rentals. Um, but a lot of them, they just have a place to go up at the lake or in the woods. Mm-hmm. It's very, very common. Yeah. And I, the impact is not just anecdotal. I have seen many really? people owe more tax because of the limitations on uh, property taxes oh, and sure. the limitations Be- on mortgage interest. I, I was going to guess that was a case study when you mentioned those folks that own a property in a in a place like the Bay Area and also own a property up here. Boy, that immediately puts you and, and uh, right the, out of the game. Yeah. And the other argument side of that is, well, if you're wealthy and you have all the money, that you should be, you can pay that. Hmm. That's the other side thinking there. Hmm. Because this turned out to be obviously a generator of income for the government. Yeah, I'm right. not. I'm not. I, I know, I'm not. Know, st- I'm not advocating one side I or know, the other. I know. <laughs> you ask. You ask me a question about. <laughs> do I think it's going to affect yeah. the ability yeah. to sell homes in certain price yeah, ranges, I think it has. and I absolutely, yeah. absolutely. think it yeah. will. No, yeah. we, we, yeah. We, we're absolutely and right it does. That. Yeah. And when you were um, working with these different camp people their and their lives and their taxes did any of them express an interest in possibly um getting rid of that asset that other second home did anybody say well maybe we should mm. think about selling Solid. good question yeah. that's a that's a really <coughs> challenging question because there are factors other than the lack of deductibility on property taxes and the reduction in mortgage interest here in jackson county you layer those two things and the smoke 
in oh, the summertime right, right. on and there are more people asking themselves the like question why, why do we own that house why do we own that <laughs> house and especially <laughs> if we want to come up wow. here up here to the rogue valley in the summertime so those 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 challenges all are working in concert to people i right. think asking mm-hmm. like the more combination questions. of those they're so asking those a question yeah. they wouldn't have asked before yeah, yeah okay. absolutely well that's that was sherman <coughs> sherman's had a big effect we haven't heard the last of that and it's still in effect this year so all that is so all that's into your thinking when you're buying and selling right if you have to think about the tax implications as you're doing this so hopefully people will what about uh uh, the effect of 1031 exchanges. We've talked a lot about those where you can There's exchange so it. many people doing that yeah. right now. While the interest rates are low, they're selling one asset and, and buying bigger or buying more. The like-minded, ex- like-minded property exchanges. We heard all, all sorts of things that there would be catastrophe going on at different times over the result of this, but that didn't seem to work out that way, right? So 1031 exchanges are still a very viable tool for taxpayers to defer income tax on gains in real property. Right. Unrealized gains in real property. So you buy a piece of property for $400,000, you use it for trade or business, the basis is reduced by depreciation to say $300,000, and 15 years later you sell it for a million. Well, you would pay tax on the gain of $650,000 if you didn't engage in a like-kind exchange or a 1031 Mm -hmm. exchange. Mm -hmm. Those are still absolutely a valid tool, particularly if you have a desire and an appetite to continue to be a landlord. You okay. um, you want to because leave- it's not individual. It's not individual property now. It, it it's totally has to be a business or it, it commercial does. or yeah. something like that. Yeah, right? you okay. have to have the you have to have an intent to use the acquired property for trade or business. Okay, and you have to prove that you used the disposed property for trade or business, which is ah, you okay. use it for a business that you're conducting or you use it as a re- a for profit rental activity. Okay. So those things uh, absolutely have to be part of the case. But if you buy a new one through a 1031 exchange, you have to continue to want, you have to want to continue to be a landlord. Okay. That's an important right. piece of it. Another important piece of it is, um, you know, particularly for older taxpayers, are you interested in making that unrealized gain and the co- subsequent tax disappear? Well, in a 1031 situation, when you leave this earth, mm-hmm. that property passes to the next generation, okay. and you no longer have deferred gain because you get a step up to fair market value when the person who left this earth leaves, really? when they die. So I have many clients where they are in, they've invested in real estate, they're in their 70s, they okay. really don't want to be a landlord anymore, no, right. but they also don't want to pay tax on the right. game and they want to leave it to their kids. Right. So they're going to suck it up, they're going to hire a property manager, mm-hmm. and they are going to continue to operate the property as a rental because they want to work the system and use the means that are legally yeah. available to you sure. to make the tax on that gain disappear. D- d- disappear. And it disappears the day they close the coffin. Uh-huh. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so okay. d- um, in Oregon, what are the estate um, tax taxes with the state of Oregon so or- in that situation awful, if they're you're awful, I think. But, but, okay. but I'm wondering like where where does Oregon stick its hand Oregon sticks its hand early and often <laughs> early and often yeah. okay Oregon has one of the most onerous uh, it does yep. a, a state transfer tax requirements in the country um, you know in a in a state where we don't have a sales tax the money to operate the government has to come from someplace, and what Oregon has chosen to do is to use a state tax. So in Oregon, if you're a single person, you can leave this earth with a million dollars in assets, and you won't owe Oregon anything. Nothing. A million dollars. A million dollars. Mm-hmm. If you have a million two, the uh, the beginning a state tax is around ten percent. So a million two, that's two hundred thousand dollars over a million. Uh-huh. Your heirs would have to write a twenty thousand dollar check to the Oregon Department of Revenue because you died. Oh wow! Do you see big checks come through like that? Do you do you, do people leave with big tax bills? 
I have um, I have prepared and uh, worked with clients on uh, state tax returns uh -huh. where millions of dollars gets transferred either to the IRS because there is still a federal estate tax. Okay, right. I'll be at a much four, higher four level. Four million or something like that. It's eleven. It? It's more than eleven point oh, two million. Oh wow. Oh yeah. Oh, so oh, there. so oh, okay. they're much more rare much, now. Much than <laughs> <laughs> I was going to wow. say wow. That's than, a big, the, okay. than they used to wow. be. Um, and hundreds of thousands of dollars in, um, on average, to but this Oregon. Is state, this is state mm -hmm. stuff. Go to the yeah. state. Yeah, no, so they're so going to get that. Even but, when you die, they're gonna, you're going to get. And we know they spend it so well yeah, once yeah. they get it. So that, that's reassuring, right? <laughs> uh, so I, I think I also heard Glenn's got bigger clients than us. I believe on his on his portfolio. Yeah, yeah, they'll pay a little bit higher tax. I don't think we'll have, we, we won't do. present yeah. you with that problem. <laughs> <laughs> they're not too happy when their wealth results in more oh, tax. Right? No, yeah, no, yeah, no. Yeah, absolutely yeah. not. So yeah. the really sad part for me is that many people move here from a state like California. Oh, right. Okay. And don't and even don't know that. about the that. Oregon estate transfer tax. And they come here and they meet with me. And on top of hearing uh -huh. all the bad news about how high mm. the income taxes here are, <laughs> that we also and the have property to, tax, and we also have to talk about the estate tax. Yes, it's significant. And it I mean, it's it significant. It doesn't help if I die over the border because I'm a resident here. Well, it doesn't help if you die over the border because you, you are a resident. <laughs> yeah. Unless you die for, for 181 days. And, 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 chance, and chances are you own property here. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we know people in common who's not whose only home is not here in Oregon. Mm. Right. And some mm -hmm. of those people mm -hmm. don't believe that they're subject to the Oregon uh, estate transfer tax. But if you own property in Oregon, you're subject to wow. it. Even though you're ca yeah. a resident of Nevada or Colorado, right, people left for the income tax that's thing. That's interesting. If they still own yeah. property here, you're still subject to it. On wow. the, on the assets that are in Oregon. Isn't yes. it amazing how government can find, oh, very it, good find at that. ways to get you, no matter what they do? We got a break coming up here. We got one more segment to go. Well, we got through another half a page, so we got seven <laughs> more pages to go in the next nine minutes. We got a break coming up here. We're with Glenn Cunningham, our CPA here from Nagel and Padilla. Don't forget, you can check out any of our past shows at realestateshoworegon.com. Please do so. We're coming right back to KCMX after this. Welcome back to The Real Estate Show on KCMX News Media 880. Pete Belcastro, Joe Brett, Alice Lima here with you. Of course, we're all brokers with John L. Scott in Southern Oregon, and we get together with you once a week here to talk about real estate issues. Glenn Cunningham's our, our featured guy today. He's a CPA from Nagel and Padilla down in Ashland, and is, uh, well, you're I don't know how the hell you keep up with all this stuff because it's uh, there's so much there when you talk about taxes and returns and laws and changes in the IRS dealing with the IRS and the Oregon Department of Revenue. Oh, <laughs> it's a lot of little details. How do you keep your sanity going? You think we're crazy. Uh, yeah, you. Yeah. A, a lot of education and a willingness to spend the time uh, to get the answers. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, in the past couple of days, we were unearthing some aspects of the uh, Qualified Business Income, mm -hmm. Section 199A, and the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that we hadn't seen before. Yeah. There are many, many downstream consequences. And the most ironic thing that, um, you know, I'm experiencing is that this Tax Cuts and Jobs Act it was presented as simplifying the tax code, <laughs> yeah, and people would right. be able to do their mm -hmm. tax returns on a postcard. Yeah. Well, first, the postcard is now a postcard with six new schedules. So your yeah. your old 1040 is now that used to be two pages is now one page plus six separate schedules. So the two page <laughs> form became a seven oh, dear, page dear. form. <laughs> So it didn't get more simple, and no. the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act has layered on many, many new considerations yeah. that affect uh, the ability of taxpayers now, to that, reduce that their was tax in our liability. That was in our 2019 tax plan planning memo that you just sent out. It was, yeah. I was shocked that I read memo. that, but there was, <laughs> you are as well, but that was great. There was great information in there. Thank yeah. you, yeah. Well, You've obviously put in the work to, to really delve through it to get through it to, to explain it to the rest of us. Thank you. Well, you got to do it the right way, also. But yeah. but be smart with this stuff. Yeah. You know, if your business, I mean, don't just pay taxes because you don't have to pay, whether you right. die or whatever. I mean, don't do that. But you got a question about rental? Or, you got a question uh, on yeah, I just I was kind of curious about what the category of safe rental meant. What what is that? If you could, which safe, safe rental? Safe, safe rental. 
right? No, I'm sorry, not safe. What? I've got two questions okay, and no, I, I mixed okay. them. Well, what was uh, one was safe harbor and the other was self rental. <laughs> so let's do oh, self rental, oh. <laughs> not safe rental. Oh, sorry. I never heard of a safe rental. <laughs> self rental. What is self rental? I've never heard self-rental. of that. Self rental. Uh, a self rental is a special category of rental where, it, as the term suggests, you're renting to yourself. Oh, okay. Renting to myself. Yeah. So say that you um, own a building and you have a restaurant and okay. your restaurant would therefore rent right. that building from you or as the individual owner of that building right. uh, to use for the operation of the restaurant. Or if you're a dentist and you buy the building that your sure, practice, right. practice is in. practice is in. A lot of people do that. Right. Okay. And there are, uh, there are lots of benefits of having a self-rental. There uh, are. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. There, there absolutely are. Um, you know, first, you're not paying somebody else. Not paying right. somebody well, else. You can't be That's evicted. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can't be evicted. There you go. <laughs> and your part of your business profits are going to increase your equity in the property right. because if you have a mortgage, okay. you're paying down the mortgage. Sure. So that's a significant benefit. Under the, the terms of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, part of the uh, it complexity relates to what happens when your income gets above certain levels. Ah. Um, and if your income goes above a certain level, you are limited on your ability to deduct this qualified business income deduction. Oh, okay. However, one of the ways that you can get around that is if you have sufficient investment in assets, you can use some of that investment in assets to justify a qualified, a higher qualified business income deduction. Oh, okay. So say that you know one of your businesses is a restaurant, okay. and you have lots of wages in that restaurant, and but you don't have a lot of assets, and you own the building, and that building is a big asset. You can take the wages that you pay your employees and the assets that you own in the self-rental, combine the two of wow. them together, and it can assist you in maximizing your qualified business income wow, deduction. that's excellent. I didn't know yeah. that, okay. So the government, pretty, okay. I mean, the social engineering aspect of this is the government is in giving you an incentive to invest, either right. invest in workers through wages okay. or invest in real property because it's showing that you're putting the money that you're earning in the business Back, back into the into economy. The, back into the, into yeah. the economy. Okay, so it's, sure. a, it's a little bit of social engineering. Yeah. Is, it, they're, they're trying is that to be commercial only, though? Yeah. Commercial only type of opportunity? Or could you own a home and have a business operating out of the home? Or is that. You like a tutor or a massage therapist mm. or. You absolutely daycare. could. Um, and you could rent a portion of your home to, to your you, business. To business. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. What about. Uh, but you've got to have a business in the right. you got to operate it as a business. Remember what about that? the okay. vacation rental? Can you do it with that where you're. You're renting it completely for, say, three weekends a month, but you live in it the rest of the time? Does that still count? So, so you live in it one weekend a month? You live in it one weekend a month. You have an RV. Let's say you have yeah, an RV. Yeah, so um, vacation rentals are very different because different. the deductibility on a vacation rental, it, you know, where you're essentially, if 100% of the house is available for vacation rental for three weeks and you live in it for one week, right? there are limitations on that because you're using it as 100% as, 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 as a residence. primary residence. Right. A better okay. alternative would be okay. to have an additional dwelling unit right. yep. and exclusively rent the additional dwelling unit. Or uh, say you're gotcha. a, you know, say you're that a, makes sense. You're a senior citizen who has still lives in the family home, and they're, um, you know, you want it, you they have a, room, a, a, a standalone uh, residence in the basement. Mm -hmm. It would benefit you to rent that regularly and exclusively mm -hmm. because then you can treat that as a rental. You live exclusively. In two, you, you live in the upper floors, and you rent out the basement. Mm -hmm. um, but if it's going back, back and, and forth, forth, that's the gray area that you get, in, you get in trouble in, right? Right. Well, you don't get in Not trouble. It just reduces your ability to take advantage of the deductions because you have yeah. a personal and asset. You don't want to reduce your ability to take advantage of the deductions. And that's the no IR IRS, a right? So you're talking about the IRS deductions. I'm just curious if the state of Oregon has any um, special. So what do they do for so, so Oregon, vacation? Well, well, Oregon um, has something so special. So I'm <laughs> sure. Here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> well, well, actually, Oregon doesn't really have anything special per se, huh. because or the calculation of Oregon income tax begins 
with the federal calculation of adjusted gross income. Oh, so the whole or- wow. the whole Oregon return is much shorter than the federal return yeah. uh-huh. because most of the activity isn't reported on the Oregon return. Because it's essentially they take the, they take or- starting so high. Oregon starts with the net. Wow. Uh, and so th- th- this never- act, you, you are still subject to audit with uh-huh. Oregon because they can look at those things mm-hmm. that produced your adjusted gross income. However, Oregon there. doesn't change the rules generally above adjusted gross income. Interesting. Unless the law in Oregon isn't in conformity with federal, federal tax law. law. And there's some instances after the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act where that's the case, but they're very limited. Hmm. Well, guess what? <laughs> we're out of time. Uh, we, we're going to have to get out of here. Uh, thank you for, for, for coming today. Uh, we just we'll, got here. We'll, we'll, yeah. we'll see you next year, okay? We'll do this again yeah. next June. Great, I look forward great to information. It. Thank that you. Was the information wonderful. always good. Uh, the best thing is always is to do it the right way and God, uh, get, get some advice. But it also, it also reinforce, you also reinforce that creating, investing in real estate, buying real estate is still a, bi- a big thing. And it can help you and you create wealth and generate income for you and all those kind of things if you do it right and do your due diligence. That's what mm-hmm. we talk and about all the time. And you can have a business that has real estate uh, included in yeah. it as another another aspect. And take mm-hmm. advantage of those, as you say, the advantages of the incentives out there to make a difference in your and life. And it That's changes every year and you need a professional yeah. that, that knows it and breathes it and lives yeah. it to help you to, get, to guide you through that. Nagel and Padilla, you can Google them and you can find Glenn Cunningham there. It's easy to get a hold of and I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. We got a time. Thanks for being here today, Joe and Alice. Uh, Ten years worth. Of, you know, we'll, we'll see you we'll down be the around. road as well. I know you'll be around as well. <laughs> Have a great week, everybody. Fourth of July is coming up as well. Uh, take care. God bless you all. We'll see you next week right back here on The Real Estate Show.